Sea of Red, it's time for another Fireside Chat, the official podcast of Flames fans. It's go time. Well, another uh, f- week for the Calgary Flames and two more wins for this team. It was a good week overall for the Calgary Flames. As always, I'm Dan alongside Matt, and we'll jump right into talking about some of these games. Uh, then we can get our thoughts on the week. Last time we talked, we just concluded the Colorado game where Calgary won 5-4 to four in overtime. And the next night, they went to Arizona where they scored another five goals to best the Arizona Coyotes with a 5-2 game. And this is uh, Jeff Ward extending his coaching streak to 6-0-0. And the Flames extend their point streak to eight games. Matt, overall thoughts on this one? I thought Calgary was looking better than they normally have been and uh they just walked right into this one and laid a thumping on the coyotes it's impressive that i mean the coyotes are above us in the standings it's impressive the flames showed so well against a team that should be a better team yeah and the fact that the flames were tired after the playing the previous night like i thought that pretty much the flames just dominated the first 45 or so minutes and then kind of took their foot off the gas towards the end of the game when's the last time you can remember the flames winning two back-to-backs it's definitely i know it happened last year but it's for this iteration of the team i think that's the first when's the last time you can remember the flames scoring 10 goals in two nights Uh, yeah it I think you'd have to go back to that uh, time that they beat the Avalanche 9-1 to to even come close to anything like that. Yeah, like we got five against Colorado, five against Arizona, another four against Toronto. That's what, 14? Um, and that's, that's, like, that's like two weeks worth of goals for how this team's been doing lately. Well, that's it. You get uh, LA, you get another four, so that's 18. Buffalo, you got another four. Like this team is on not just a winning streak, but this team's putting a lot of pucks in the net recently. Yeah, and it, you knew that that had to correct itself. Like, this team is too good to, in terms of just raw talent to be playing as badly as they have been. And it just makes sense that the, things like that are going to correct themselves. Like, this team was one of the top offensive teams in the league last year. And now, like this season, only... Uh, Anaheim, L.A., Chicago, and uh, Dallas have fewer goals in the Western Conference than Calgary does right now. And that's three of the four worst teams in the league, in the West, I mean, and Dallas. So, you know, it shows that, like, Calgary, and that's even after this last week and a half of excellent offense. So... You know, that that just was not going to continue. Like, if Calgary was playing like they should have been from the get-go, they'd probably be about 20 more goals to this point in the season than they were thus far. If we look at this game, we saw Michael Froelich get his third. Zach Ronaldo got his second. That still surprised me that this guy is even on the NHL team and scoring. Uh, Lucic gets his third. And, of course, Johnny Goudreau starts getting going again, and he got his seventh of the year. So yeah, good to see some depth scoring and good to see those top guys. I mean, Monty got a goal as well, so we got the top guys scoring and the depth guys going. Yeah, and that's what the Flames need to be successful is having both the Goudreau and Monaghan pairing getting goals and other people chipping in. And basically, for most of the season, it was just the depth pieces and guys like Kachuk and Lindholm scoring, and Gaudreau and Monaghan were basically MIA. And now things seem to have changed in the other direction, and hopefully that continues moving forward into the rest of the month. Yeah, and we'll see it as soon as we talk about the Toronto game as well, but we definitely saw Johnny continue going. Um, Well, let's jump over there, I guess, unless there's anything else you want to talk about with this uh, Coyotes game. I do. I want to talk about Cam Talbot. I thought he had an excellent performance. He made 46 saves, and it was his second game in three for the Flames, and I thought he played rather well. Uh, the Flames kind of let it, the game go a bit in the third period, which makes sense because they were up by so much, and who really cares? You know, like if <laughs> you can just kind of let the other team 
burn themselves out at that point. Well, I think, that, as you mentioned, the team was tired, too. And to me, it looked like they might have been more conserving energy than anything. Mm-hmm. And to Arizona's credit, they did push. It's just not enough. Yeah, and, you know, Talbot, you and I have talked about Cam Talbot this year and talked about him in a few different, you know, situations. Some where he's looked good, some where he's looked bad, some where the team hasn't played in front of him. This is about the way I would have expected this team to have played in front of David Riddick as well. Like, I don't think we're seeing now that the team's not playing well for the second goaltender. Um, and I think, as you and I talked about way back in September, in order to be successful, this team's going to have to get both goalies running. Yeah, and if Talbot can help to spell Riddick a bit, that will pay a lot of dividends as the Flames get closer to the postseason. Yeah, we need we need both guys. I, I think it's there's pros and cons, right? We need both guys to get going, but I also think that Talbot's probably not here next year. So, you know, you want to get him going, but the better he does, the more money it's going to take to keep him here, and I think the better he shows for somebody else. Yeah, I can see that. You know, I think that this was sort of his bounce back year. He took a discount to bounce back in Calgary. And I just, I think with all the goaltending talent that we have on the farm, they're going to have to promote somebody. Yeah. Uh, especially with, when you have Zab, uh, Zagadul in 11, 1 and 1 or something like that right now. It's, yeah, like there's a lot of different options the Flames have for next season. Yeah. There's options, you know, in Zagadul and there's options in Gillies. There's options in. I guess those are probably the only two guys that are ready. They could even go and find another veteran if they need to. But I think that, you know, we want Talbot to get going, like you said, for the playoffs. But I, I think that there's pros and cons to it because if he gets going too much, it's going to be too costly to keep him here. Yep. But, yeah, definitely looked good in this one. Um, I'm just He made 46 saves. That's a lot of rubber to see, especially for, uh, you know, a goaltender who's not playing as much. But good to see him going in two games in three. And it looks like Jeff Ward, I think, wants to keep these guys going at a little more of an even pace. Which I would be very good. I, I would be surprised if we don't see um, – I mean, we have a back-to-back, but I would be surprised if we don't see um, Talbot again in at least one more game for Christmas. Yeah, especially because of the fact that the Flames' quality of competition over the next stretch is kind of... There's not a lot of good teams, I frankly. think we'll see probably one game at home and one game on the road for Talbot. Yeah, it wouldn't be entirely... Well, I'd be shocked, frankly, if Talbot's not starting the uh, Minnesota game for sure. And it just depends on how things go against Pittsburgh, whether he gets the Montreal game as well. Yeah, well, we'll talk about those games when we get to uh, the week ahead. But looking at the week that was, the big game of the year, I'm always surprised how many blue shirts there are in the Dome when Toronto comes to town. Well, you know, uh, in my family, like, both my parents are from Toronto. so My like, apologies. I, yeah, it was always annoying going to the, the games against the Leafs and where I'd be cheering for the Flames and my father would be cheering for the Leafs. Boo. But, you know, it is what it is. So, you know, and I'm sure there's a lot of people in Calgary that are from Toronto or know people from Toronto or are just annoying Leaf fans in general. And so, yeah, <laughs> this they get is tickets. A, and... Even for people that weren't Toronto fans, I think for me this game was a quite a big game because I think coming into this season, both these teams were looked at to have really good years. A lot of people thought this could be Toronto's year. A lot of people thought this, you know, Calgary had to get better. Like, I think coming into this, these were two really hot teams. And there's even people last year that thought we might see a Calgary-Toronto Stanley Cup final. Well, so. that wouldn't have been a bad bet. You know, Calgary was the second best team in the league last year. Toronto was the fourth best team in the league. And they were only separated by two points with 107-105. So, you know, it would have been a decent bet that like those teams would have had a successful season this year. But then, you know, coaching weirdness for both teams got in the way. and Well, that's it. And even though they're not doing well, their seasons have mirrored each other in a lot of ways. Yeah. 
So if we take a look at the game, this was a, a game here at the Saldome, and as we talked about earlier, the Flames didn't get five. They could only get four in this one. Uh, Travis Hamanick got his second of the year. Johnny Goudreau got on the board twice. That's not something we say a lot this year with his eighth and ninth, and Froelich once again scoring his fourth of the year. So for me, the big news here is Johnny gets two goals in a game. I'm going to actually add another one. How good has Michael Froelich looked since Bill Peters left. Well, that's it. You can definitely tell something was there between him and Bill. Like, Bill was relegating him to the fourth line, even a healthy scratch a few times. And we know that Michael Furleek, while I wouldn't say he's a, a second liner, he's been playing on that 3M line so often that we've kind of, you know, accepted him there. But, yeah, he's looking really good. And, and I think that he's... I don't think he looks good enough to re-sign him at the same price, but he's definitely... He's looking like he's an NHL veteran, which he is, and I'm hoping he's auditioning well so we can get more for him come deadline. Well, I if he wants to come back, frankly, it, you know, like I wouldn't expect it to be more than like two and a half, but you know, if that was the case, you know, if he continues to play like he is, that wouldn't be a bad option. Yeah, you know, again on like a one or two year deal, like not. Yeah, I don't even right. know if I'd give him two and a half. I mean, if if we've got if the cap doesn't go up much, and I know you've talked about guys like um, Taylor Hall, who we'll talk about later coming in. Like I think the Flames need some cash, and I think that shedding Fro Leak and putting Dubé in there would be an easy way to shed some cash. I agree. But yeah, definitely he's looking good, and you know he's on a line right now for a leak with Jankowski and Reader, and I think those three guys are complementing each other well. You've got a little bit of everything on that line. Janko still hasn't scored, but you've got a little bit of everything on that line. And there's a few games this week where, especially Reader, was making some good breaks for the net. We saw some good speed from that line. Like I, I really think this new lineup that Jeff Ward is running that we talked a little bit about last week, we've got a little bit of everything on every line now. Yeah, and that helps because of the fact that somebody is going to be playing against bad defensemen. You know, like, you can't have your first pairing against three separate lines. And so that's going to allow some favorable matchups for the Flames, and all it takes is one good break, and that, that can change a game. So it'll be interesting to see for how much longer this splitting up of everybody is going to continue. But that was one of the reasons why, like previously I was advocating for a guy like Hall or, you know, s some form of top six forward, just so that way the flames can stretch out their offense a little bit more throughout the lineup and allow the, this kind of a thing to happen where like you're going to be putting pressure on the entire defense of the opposition not just the first pairing i mean if you would have told me that we were going to see johnny gudra on the third line for all intents and purposes this year i probably would have hung up on you but you know it, it's working well and you know i mean every line needs a number of some kind so you can talk about it but you know, Goudreau, Ryan, Lucic, it's a really weird pairing. Not three guys I would put together, but again, a little bit of everything on that line. Yeah, and it helps, and it encourages Ryan and Lucic to play a little better as well. And when you have a guy like Goudreau, you're going to get some good passes going your way. And, you know, and I like the fact that the team does split uh, Goudreau onto that line and on with uh, both Backlund and Monaghan. You know, and it just depends on the situations. And this team, you know, in order to be successful, you need to be able to play in a bunch of different ways. And I'm glad that uh, Ward is switching things up to make this team a little bit more difficult to play against. You know, when I look at this lineup and I think, crap, at some point we're going to have to stick... Um Bennett back into it like you look at it and go where do you put him oh well, that that's a all it's a good right problem, problem to have to right have. yeah yeah it, you know it's when you're getting the unfortunate uh, problem of having uh guys like Dubé and Manjapane looking like legitimate top nine forwards that it kind of makes your life a little difficult because okay we have too many good players where do we put them all yeah not a problem we're used to here in Calgary. No. 
Anything else about that Toronto game you want to chat about? Uh, not really, other than Toronto sucks and boo. <laughs> well, that was the end of the Calgary Flames' seven-game win streak. They came into the matinee game at the Dome against the Hurricanes. And this team traditionally doesn't do well against matinee games, but every good thing has to come to an end at some point. You know, you can't win all the rest from here on out. And the Calgary Flames lose 4 nothing to the Hurricanes um, and end that streak. My thoughts on this one, I thought in the first half of the first period, the Flames had a great forecheck. They really set the tempo and pace early on. Like we saw, you know, going into this one, the Flames often, as we've seen, sort of, you know, letting the opponents set the pace, but they really set the pace in that one. And, like, I I don't know what happened. It just looked like they, they ran out of gas. Yeah, it's like they got frustrated that they just didn't score. Yeah, that's that's, that's probably it. One goal went in, another goal went in, and by then the game was over. Yeah, like if the the first period, like if Calgary had scored a goal at any point in this game, I think it was would have probably been a 4-5-1 or five, one Calgary victory. It's just that they got, they threw so many pucks at the net, and Reimer, to his credit, played well. And after the first period, Calgary didn't have anything to show for their good period. And Carolina stymied them a bit. Then there was that bizarre weirdness with that one goal, uh, which was onside. It just, you just know, there like was a in, lot of uh, confusion. Just like in 04, the goal was in, right? Yeah, well, it was there was a lot of confusion just because of the fact that usually that play gets called down on the thought that, well, he's maintaining possession and even though like he chipped it in, but he didn't really chip it far in. It it was a weird play and like I can understand why a lot of people, especially when it happened, were upset, but it got the threw the team off entirely. And then the quick second goal from Hamilton on the ensuing power play. I really think those two goals are when the Flames sort of lost their mojo. Like, the Flames, I thought, played really well in the first. They played okay to start the second, and just as they were starting to get going, you got two quick goals from Carolina, and that's when the Flames just unraveled. Yeah, and then they couldn't get anything going at all in the third, and it was just a listless performance, and... It is what it is. Sometimes you guys have stupid games where one little thing goes wrong and then everything falls apart. And, you know, it, it is what it is. And I'm glad that the Flames have had a couple of days off to, like, practice, reset themselves, and even to stew on it a bit to, like, not get complacent. And, and, and they were trying to have a lighter practice. Did you see today at practice? They were uh, kicking around a, a soccer ball. Yeah, and I think that like you need to have like that focus and attention to details and all of that. And like sometimes bizarre things happen. Like you can't help but not have weird things happen. It's hockey. You get weird, dumb bounces all the time. It's just that uh, the Flames need to be able to overcome that kind of stupidity when it happens and you know like okay yeah they, they scored a weird one you know reset yourself and then come back and go ahead and that's going to be the real test here is how the calgary flames bounce back like you said they have a couple of days off and tomorrow night the pittsburgh penguins are in town and i really think that that's going to be you know everybody loses there's no team that's ever gone 82 and 0 you know, how well do you bounce back from the loss, especially at home, is the big question for me. So we'll we'll see what happens in that one. But some interesting stats go, for this game. As we talked about, 22 goals in the last five games for the Flames going into this one. That's a crazy number. Like this team, as we talked about, has had scoring explode. And in uh, their last 10 games, there's been a 20 possible points and they've picked up 17 of them. So this is really a team that's rocking now. Like you've got... You know, we went on that six-game losing streak, and the sky started falling, and now we've pretty much erased it, and we're plus one. Yeah. It's good that they managed to cancel that out now that they're, you know, even though they've had such a great streak, they're still eighth place. 
Well, you know, yeah, and, and that's it. If you look at it last week, I think when we talked, they were fourth in the West or fourth in the Pacific, and they worked so hard. Now where are they? Fourth in the Pacific. Yeah, and it's like, okay, yeah, that's great. And then, like, you are only two points out of third in the West, so it's a little bit of a log. Well, jam you're only right two now. points out of out of a tie for first in the Pacific, too. Yeah, it, so, like, it, you know, you've made your situation a lot better, but, you know, Arizona, who is first, just got Taylor Hall. And, like, okay, you just erased all the bad crap that happened in the first month and a half of the season. Now you have to start, like, at zero. Okay, now proceed. And Calgary needs to step up and continue this hot streak. Like, they can't, say, like, lose three of the four games between now and Christmas. Otherwise, they're going to end up falling right back into, like, 11th, 12th, 13th. Well, and even if we look in the Pacific, I mean, like you said, Arizona is 42 points right now. Uh, Vegas is 41. Us and Edmonton are tied for 40. Vancouver's at 36. San Jose, 34. Anaheim, 32. And LA, 31. Like, there's a nine-point differential between the last team and the top team. Yeah. So, really, I mean, LA could go on a hot streak and, and take us over right now. Yeah, like if LA, you know, is inspired by Kovalchuk walking away from their team, they they could be right back in it. I don't know if that's an inspiring thing, but maybe. Well, it depends on how much they like Kovalchuk. <laughs> yeah, so you yeah, know, I mean, he's I, gone. <laughs> I mean, it's tight, and like you said, we've got to stay in this, and we can't. You know, you're always going to win a couple, lose a couple, but you've got to sort of play at least 500 pace to, I think, to even be competitive right now because it is such a tight division. Yeah, and frankly, our, the Flames division is rather mediocre. Like, there are no really dynamite teams in our division. Like, even with Arizona getting Taylor Hall, like, I'm not wowed by anything that no, they but, have. No, but we can't rely on, say, Edmonton sliding for us to make it in. Like, we've got no, to do it on like, our own. That's what, yeah, well, that's the point I was trying to get to, is that, you know, Calgary is in con firm control of their own destiny. Like, none of the teams are particularly scary, and they can rocket themselves into first place. Like, even if they just continue playing above average hockey and due to the quality of their com opponents between now and the all-star break, they could end up being like six, eight, ten points ahead of everybody else in the division just because of the fact that we're playing so many bad teams from now until the all-star break. And Calgary just needs to take care of their own business. Some bad teams, but also if you look at where we are now, some important points. Like Even between now and the end of this month, we've got – Edmonton and Vancouver, and the, those are the two teams that sandwich us in the standings right now. So, you know, some important must-win games in there as well. Oh, for sure. And it, it'll be interesting to see how the team continues to do. And they've got themselves into a good spot right at this point, but they have to just keep going. And that's the problem when you get into such a long winning streak is that sometimes you think, oh, well, I just have to show up and I'll beat the other team. And the the good habits start going away and, you know, then you have to re-kick yourself in the butt to get going again. And, and you said we we're eighth in the West, but only six points separate us from St. Louis, who's the top. Like, as we talked about in the past, very doable. You could be at that point in the next week. Yeah, well, like, say the Flames uh, go on the protracted winning streak and, like, continue, like, winning, like, say, three out of four games right through the All-Star break, like, cause, and which is, is doable because they're playing a lot of bad teams that, you know, Calgary could end up being the best team in the West by the All-Star break and with a cushion. And... Because the most difficult part of our schedule is already done. That was right through till... That was a crazy road trip. Yeah, right through till uh, the six-game losing streak, basically, was when the, the hard part of the Flames schedule concluded, and now it's just a lot of iffy teams from here on until the middle of May, or March, I mean. So, uh, you know, and... Uh, Calgary has an opportunity if they just play consistently 
decent hockey like what we were used to in the early part of last season and since Ward took over, if they can play that kind of game consistently, then like there's no doubt in my mind that the Flames will be first in the West. I don't want to get too far ahead ourselves, but we have 15 games until the bye week slash all-star break. But traditionally, this team hasn't come out well after that all-star break. And I'm, I think that's one thing that they have to figure out why and make sure that that doesn't happen again this year because I well, think the, you know, the Pacific's going to be so year, tight. Yeah, the one year they ended up going to the same hotel in Mexico as the Edmonton Oilers, and then they started to play like the Edmonton Oilers. So, you know, figure out where Edmonton's going and go somewhere else entirely, and then you don't have to worry about that. <laughs> Yeah, well, but even last year they weren't at the same hotel as Edmonton and they they still didn't come out well after. I think sometimes it's, you know, guys are getting lazy, they're sitting at home, I don't know if they're working out as much, and it, you know, I think when you're, it's a chance to get your head out of the game and look around a bit and go, oh, hey, we're number one, and I think sometimes the best thing to do is just keep going. Yeah, no. You know, sometimes when you're working on something, you lose track of time. Like, I think that's sort of how the season is. And having that week break, it's like, oh, wow, we're number one. Okay, we can, you know, coast a little bit from here on. Yeah, well, Calgary, I think that with how everything happened last year, I think that this is going to be an interesting uh, point in this season is seeing whether or not they can – modify their own behavior Uh, because like you saw last year how they basically fell off the face of the earth after that and backed into the playoffs even though they were first and then got thumped by the avalanche and you know if calgary has a similar bad finish to the season there's you you're gonna have to do something to shake up the team because of the fact that like you know you can't just like you're not gonna do anything if you're you know sliding on the way in Uh, like most teams that end up winning the stanley cup or going far in the playoffs are teams that are hot at the right time and calgary you know last season (laughs) that was not good and hopefully they can just carry on doing well well here's Um, an interesting stat we're 15 games from the break and 13 games after that to the trade deadline so we're sort of halfway you know the breaks halfway between the two so you got to get going now and then you got to keep it going afterwards if not like you said maybe then it's time to make some moves yeah and like i still think that the flames need to add a forward that's good to this roster and maybe two it, if the price is right well let's talk about uh tr- the trade market in a little bit yeah let's get through some uh some flames news first odd move this week this is one of those weird um you know salary cap slash cba circumvention things it seems like austin zarnick goes down to stockton sent there in a conditioning stint does his conditioning stint and then it's like oh but he's too hurt to play in the nhl so he's recalled to calgary and kept on the on the uh, on the LTIR, the long term injury reserve. Yeah, I don't know what happened there. Like unless he tweaked something again in the. He played three the, games in Stockton. He got one goal, two assists for three points. So I mean, it's not like he went down there and didn't play. He's obviously yeah, healthy enough like, to play hockey. Yeah, it's one of those where he must have tweaked something, and so they just recalled him and put him back. Did on he the tweak LTIR. something or? tweak something for our audio listeners who can't see me i'm using air quotes did he tweak something yes he had Ow, bad airline food on his cut. way back yeah like, i have a paper cut yeah, yeah you know but it's just it's a weird move it's like the man went down there he was healthy he played three games he looked good then he comes back up and not even like day to day but it's like oh you're back on ltir like that's i don't know it's it's got to be legal under the cba but it just seems like one of those weird cba things yeah Oh, like, they got they got to figure some way of you know it, figuring out this whole who's going to stay in the NHL thing. Every first. year, every year we see you know language tightened up around the CBA, and this is one I could see getting tightened up in the summer that you have to be removed from the LTIR before going on a conditioning stint, and you can't be put back on it for X number of days after. 
Yeah, unless there's a legitimate re-aggravation of an injury or, you know, like the NHL doctors have to put you back on the LTIR, not the team doctors. Dr. Nick? Yeah. Hello, Austin Zonick! Um... (laughs) Yeah, it's just, it's such a weird thing. And, you know, we were talking last week about what's going to happen with, um, you know, with this roster when everyone's healthy. And you'd mentioned Dubé this week and um, Manjupani this week looking like top six forwards, which they are. I honestly wouldn't be surprised, Matt, if the Stockton Heat is the final destination for Austin Zarnick this year. I think when guys get healthy, he'll get waived. I don't think anyone's going to take him. And down to Stockton, he goes. Yeah. I could see that. He's, I to think me, the that most Ren- expendable guy right now. Yeah, I think Ronaldo goes first just for ease of use. Well, I think Ronaldo and... will go down when Bennett comes back. Yeah, and then it's a toss-up between Reader, frankly, and Zarnik, and I think you're right, Zarnik. I'd... Yeah, it, it, I think that Dubé is basically taking Zarnik's role on well, the Well, and I NHL think just team. cost-wise, too, Dubé seven seven 700,000, well, 778. I think if you send Zarnik down, this team's trying to... I think they're putting Zarnik on uh, LTIR just to get the LTIR cap relief. Like, I think right now they might send Zarnik down just to get a couple hundred thousand. Yeah, I could see that, too. And, you know, maybe he'll get called back, but that's just my my hunch is that by, let's say, the end of December, Austin Zarnick is a, is a member of the Stockton Heat. And I think that makes Reeder the 13th forward at that point. Yep. I don't know what the return date for, uh, for Bennett is. I don't think anyone's seen anything. Yeah, he's skating, but, yeah, that's one of those where possibly by Christmas, but... You know, who there's knows? four games that we don't really need him in before Christmas, and then we got a three day Christmas break, the Edmonton game, another day break, and then Vancouver. My guess is they reactivate him in Vancouver. That could be, or not in Vancouver, sorry, versus Vancouver here in Calgary. Yeah, I could see that. It just, I think it just depends on like it, it would be different if the Flames needed Sam Bennett like right now, but I think you can. With the, how the team's rolling, you can just kind of like say, "Hey, get healthy, man." Just yeah, you know. and I think if this team starts to lose a couple, maybe then Ward shakes up the lines again, and that's where Bennett might slot in. Yeah, I agree. Um, so that was sort of a, a weird move for the Flames this week. Another move we all thought was weird when it happened, and I wonder your thoughts now, sort of halfway through the season. Neil for Lucic. I remember talking about this with you in the summer, and we were kind of scratching our heads at this one. And coming into the season, I know there's a lot of people looking at this going, wow, Neil's scoring at Edmonton. Lucic is doing nothing in Calgary. Edmonton got the better of this. Now that we're seeing Lucic heat up a little bit here, what are your thoughts on this deal now? Do you think it, it was one of those deals where it's starting to be good for both teams? Do you think that one team is clearly a loser so far? What are your thoughts? Well, Edmonton is clearly the loser just because it's Edmonton. But uh, So you're you saying know, Edmonton is no less of losers because of this? No, exactly. Like All they've done is harm their own future draft pick you know, and possibly given us a third. So, yeah, it, uh, Neil... Like the one thing that I was worried about with that Neil Lucic trade was is Neil going to bounce back and be the James Neil that we had seen for like the prior dozen years? And he hasn't. Like, yeah, he's scoring a lot of goals on the power play. Yeah, that's great. Awesome. You know, and I think you put any NHL or like Chase on on the power play with McDavid and Drysidel, and you're going to score some goals. And I, you know, like, yeah, he's great. You know, that's 14 goals and, you know, that'll definitely help us get a lot closer to that third round pick. But for his play besides tapping pucks in, he's been the same mediocre, not so good player. And, you know, like, uh, from what I've seen of Neil in Edmonton, like, there's not really much difference between how he played here last year, other than he's getting some tap-ins on the power play. And Lucic, while, you know, he, he's a very overpaid player, he's doing all the little things right. And he's not a defensive black hole. He's engaged in the game. He's 
willing to hit people. And he's chipped in a bit. And, yeah, you know, you're spending five and a quarter million dollars on him. You'd like more production from that. But in terms of the raw player for player, Calgary, I feel, got the better player out of it. Calgary needed a bottom six guy, and we got a guy who's comfortable in bottom six role. Edmonton yeah. needed a top six guy, and they got a guy who better fits a top six role. Yeah, and Neil, like the difference between the two is if Neil is not scoring, he is a black hole. And he is not good defensively. He doesn't really hit or engage anymore. Well, in every other team he was on, he pretty much had one role, which is everyone's job is to get the puck on his stick, and he pots it home. Yeah, and Lucic, though, is good with all of those intangibles. And plus, it helps as a deterrent from other teams doing stupid stuff to Gaudreau. Like, I've noticed that this year, the amount of slashing and other assorted BS that Gaudreau's had to go through has dropped significantly. And part of that, I feel, is from Lucic's presence on the team. Because you know that if you, you know, take liberties... Either you or one of your teammates is going to get thumped by Lucic. And, you know, it's unfortunate that the game still has to be played in that manner, but it is what it is. And Lucic is probably the single best guy for that type of role in the league. And, you know, basically him and Ryan Reeves are the one and two for that role. And and I would rather have, even though we're paying him a little bit more, I'd rather have Lucic than Reeves because I find Reeves still to be very one-dimensional. I think there's a lot more to Luch's game. Yeah, I agree. And Lucic is a little bit more offensively gifted, and like he still has the talent in him to step up. It's just, you know... He's not quite as good as he used to be, but yeah, I think we'll this s- I think this deal works well for both teams now. I'm I'm a little more optimistic about it after seeing Luch start to get a few goals and play with Johnny, but I think both teams got what they needed. I don't think that you're gonna see um, Mike Smith nor James Neal be the savior in Edmonton or the player that takes them to the promised land. You know, we're already starting to see Smitty falter as well, but I think. Both teams got what they needed, and looking back at this, I think, yeah, it, when we look back at this season, we'll say Lucic was a big part of this team, and we're so glad we had him. Yeah, and like especially like the regular season, for all intents and purposes, doesn't matter. Like It does, but it's just to get you to the dance. And when it comes time for the playoffs, which would you rather have? The big physical guy who can throw another team off their game or a guy who just floats well like you said earlier i think that the flames been pushed around in the playoffs the last couple of times they've been in and i think not even having a physical guy but just that policeman you know not even to throw them off their games but just someone to be there if they if anyone pulls anything i think when we played against anaheim they've outbodied us i think that um colorado bodied us so yeah i want the big physical dude yeah, and like that's why like I know some fans want to get rid of Sam Bennett, but like that's why I was so disappointed when the the Flames weren't able to resign Garnett Hathaway. It's not that Hathaway's like the best awesomest guy in the league. It's just that he does that role very effectively. It's okay, man. And, we still have Lomberg. Yeah. Well, you know what I mean though. Like we need that physical presence to just, you know, yeah, no, but I, I'm just saying you, you like those kind of players. And your boys the last couple of years have been Hathaway and Lomberg. Oh, I know. I, th- but, you I, know, I thought like you were going to be the, I thought it was going to be like Christmas last year and the two of them played on the line for like three shifts together. Oh, I know. That was fun. Um, it was brave, but it was fun. <laughs> but yeah, you know, it's you're right. They need physicality. And I don't think James Neal was doing us any good in a bottom six role. They tried him in a top six role and he didn't do us any good there either. So, you know, you said that Lucic is overpaid and he is, but you could argue that Neal was overpaid for us for what he was doing. I'd rather oh, overpay yeah. for Lucic than I'd rather overpay for Neal. Yeah, like Neal, frankly, is a buyout walking. You know, like that's basically... The only thing that you can realistically do with James Neal, even now on Edmonton, like he's not a $6 million player, whatever they're 
you know, like the combined retained and his contract. Like that's just I'll be a curious bad to contract. see if there's any way they can pawn that off on either Auto or Seattle next year. Yeah. And like frankly, like I don't wouldn't expect the Flames to like I would expect that Lucic might end up uh becoming one of those LTIR like Datsuk or Hosa type guys down the road like Zarnik I don't, type guy yeah like I don't see uh like the Flames paying out all four years of the contract for Lucic but we'll yeah see. We'll, we'll see I I don't know what's gonna go on with Lucic's contract I mean it's less than six million I don't they really can't buy it out um you're not gonna send it down to Stockton yeah, I think you're right. It might either be a long-term injury thing or you might find a team like Ottawa who needs to get to the floor and find some way to move it there. Yeah, like yeah, like wait till July 1st after the, his uh bonus is paid out like when he has like a year or two left and you know, then see if you can't flip him because hey, you get like 12 million dollars worth of cap hit for only like five and a half million dollars. Yeah. You know, which I'm sure that there are teams that would be like, yeah, I'll be all over that. So, you know, we'll see. Uh, like, that I'm not worried about. Like, I know a lot of fans are worried about that contract, but it's movable. It's just, yeah. Yeah, I mean, you know, it's not a great deal, but I think looking at what Tree Living has done, I have no doubt that he'll find some sensible way to deal with it when it's time. Mm-hmm. You know, the guy's not someone who we've looked at a lot and said, what the heck is he doing? This guy, yeah. he always finds a way. Yeah, he, he does an adequate job for what he's, he's... He knows how to play hockey. He's, like And, that you know, he's a very good two-way player. And, and, you know, Lucic, I think, is a positive force in the room, which Neil wasn't. And I could even see here, you know, if they need to keep Luch around with a letter as he gets older and mm-hmm. use him more as that, you know, me- locker room mentor and say, okay, at least we're getting some value for him that way. Yeah, well... That's why, like, one of the things that I've always uh, been wanting this team to get is guys that have won the Stanley Cup. Like, it's one thing, like, if you've gone to the Stanley Cup finals and all that, but there's a difference when you actually win the thing. And, you know, Calgary, for the longest time, has really lacked having that kind of experience in the locker room and... You know, like even in '04, it was basically Yell and Jelena being the only two guys that had ever won a cup. And you know, you just need to have some guys in the room, especially in the playoffs, who have been through that war and won that to be able to teach guys like this is how you actually handle this situation successfully in the postseason. And you know, it's one of those underrated things, but. Well, you know, you, you typically like when you look at teams that win the Stanley Cup, typically the team that wins has at least a couple of guys who have won the cup before. Yeah. It, it you on occasion you get a bunch of, you know, virgin on there where like they don't have any cup winners on the team, but usually there's one or two and you know, it, it's just an interesting thing, and, you know. I mean, we've seen in the past Giordano play really well with young defensemen. You know, we've seen Anderson with him, stuff like that, and he's really taken that role. I even think, you know, with Brody, he's taken a younger defenseman and elevated his game. And I wonder if down the road, as this contract becomes to look, you know, less and less like a – a good deal for the Flames. They say, you know what, let's leave Lucic there. Maybe let's put Bennett and someone else with them and use Lucic to teach those guys how to be that sort of grinder, agitator guy. Sort of like your, you know, your Giordano, but in a different way. Yeah. I agree. One thing you and I haven't agreed on in the past was Taylor Hall, and if the Flames should acquire him, that speculation is now over. Taylor Hall moved today, um, not to the Calgary Flames, but to one of the teams that were chasing the Arizona Coyotes. The Coyotes acquired Taylor Hall and some guy named Blake Spears in exchange for a 2020 first-round conditional pick, a 2021 conditional third-round pick, Nate Shanner, Nick Merkley, and Kevin Ball. So... 
Really nobody you've heard of there. I think Nick Merkley is probably the prospect that stands out the most to me in that deal. Um, really, if you look at this, and we won't spend too much time talking about the Coyotes, but yeah. let's talk about this as, an, as what the implications are on the Flames. Looking at trying to chase the Coyotes now, Matt, do you think this makes the Coyotes that much better? Well, anytime you add a player like Hall, you're going to, and without deleting from your NHL roster, you're going to see an improvement. Um, it makes him better this year. Yeah, I don't see Hall being... Uh, like, how would you say? Carol, or Arizona is one of those teams where they don't have a ton of high, high-end skill. And adding Hall to it, it makes it better, but... Like, I don't view their forward group as being as good as Calgary's even. And, like, I view our defense and goaltending being at least on par, like, for the goaltending and our defense being better. So, like, it helps, but, like, that's not going to make them the team to beat in the division. It does make them one of the teams to be feared, and I think that they will probably make the playoffs now. I don't think they'll have a ton of success. Like, they might win a round, but I don't see them going far, far into the postseason. And, yeah, it, you know, it does help rekindle some of the enthusiasm in Arizona, and hopefully they actually get a few fans in the building now. But, uh, it, you know, it, it's... Just looking <laughs> stat-wise this year, just to sort of compare here, because I think a lot of people have put Hall up on a bit of a pedestal. Hall so far has 25 points this season in 30 games, six goals and 19 assists. If we compare him to our top guys um, for the Calgary Flames so far this year, let's look at, say, Elias Lindholm, who plays on the opposite side of the ice, but Elias Lindholm has 23 points in 35 games. Uh, Sean Monaghan has 28 points in 35 games. And Matthew Kachuk, 27 points. And Johnny Goudreau, 26 points. So pretty much take any one of our top players and slot them into that lineup. Yeah. I, I think this is definitely a, a good move for the for the Coyotes this year. They, like you said, add without subtracting. They didn't have to give anything up. But I don't think it's going to be... I don't think this is going to make a huge difference down the road. It might it might get them a few more wins. I don't think Hall re-signs there, and I don't think it's necessarily going to mean that, you know, the Flames' days are numbered or anything. This isn't what's going to, you know, shift the tide. Yeah, well, like, how would you say with uh, Hall, like, even if he signs there, say he signs, like, a seven- or eight-year deal and actually stays in the desert, uh, that basically just makes Arizona – like the second or third best team in our division for a long time. It not, you know, like that doesn't push them over the hump and make them like a contender for the division every year. That just makes them a playoff team. And like, that's great. Like, don't get me wrong. Like that's very important for that organization to actually get some success and hopefully, you know, get out of the funk of being a, the perennial loser like they have been for the last decade but you know it's not uh, uh you're not seeing like the emergence of like the st louis blues here where you know or the colorado avalanche or something like that where like it's the part that puts them over the top it'll help them but it's just not as big of a it's sort of like the Ole Jokinen trade for the Flames, like, when we got him. Like, we had some parts, and, like, he helped to make the team a little better, but it didn't really make the team a contender. Like, Well, it just... even if you look at their top line now, it's probably going to be Hall, who will be wearing number 91. I'm surprised that Clayton Keller wouldn't give up nine, but whatever. Um, Hall, Dvorak, and Kessel. Like, I think... Hall's 28, Dvorak's 29. Those guys are coming off their most productive years. Kessel's probably, I would imagine, in his last couple years of the NHL. And then you look at who's coming up on that forward line, like Keller, Soddenberg, and Schmaltz for the second line, and Hinnestroza, Stepan, and Kraus the third. Like you said, they've really got nothing else. Yeah, like They've they been have scoring some by good committee parts. there. Yeah, they've got some good parts, but like... Frankly, New Jersey's forward group is about comparable to 
it, with Taylor Hall as what Arizona's is. Like it, they're all right. But, like I think you know. I think Arizona's got some good defensive pieces with Ekman Larson and Chikrin, um, but I think now they've really got their star forward. Yeah, and I know like I just don't see like this being like a franchise altering trade for Arizona. No, it, and I don't think it'll change Calgary's destiny that much this year either. No, like it put it this way, I think it'll probably add about six to eight points for Arizona in the standings, which is big. And like that would probably be the difference between them being like eighth to tenth to being like fifth or so overall in the West. But, you know, I don't see them magically jumping in with St. Louis and Colorado as like one of the top three teams in the West. If it you helps. look at. If you look at this from a different angle of, as you mentioned, the Calgary Flames probably need to go out and find themselves one, if not two free agent forwards by, or let's not say free agent, but likely to be free agent rental forwards by the end of the year. I think that, um, I think Hall was probably high on that list of guys that could be rented. How do you think now with what the price was for Hall? Do you think that now makes it cheaper for Calgary to go and acquire a forward who probably won't be the same caliber? Do you think it doesn't alter the market? Like, what do you think this does for Calgary looking not necessarily long term, but from now to the trade deadline in terms of trying to get a forward? Well, with Hall, you're hoping that you basically sign him for the seven, eight year deal. And. You know, and having him as a core piece of your team moving forward. And with him being off the market, like, that's part of why it was such a high acquisition cost. Like, it, you know, it, like, yeah, like, none of the pieces that they gave up were particularly great, but, you know, Ball's a pretty good young defenseman. Merkley. It reminds Should me a lot of the deals the Flames have been making where they're giving a bunch of, you know, draft picks for an NHL player. Yeah, like, uh, the most valuable parts, the two, f well, the one for sure first, and then the other that's uh, possibly first or a second. Uh, but the, uh, yeah, like, Calgary, uh, with any of the other free agents that are, or impending free agents, or guys like Zucker, like, it's not going to cost you that much. Like, anywhere near as much. I guess the reason I was asking you that is I thought that when the Taylor Hall deal eventually came, it would have cost a lot more than it did. And I, yeah. th and I think that now that you've seen Taylor Hall traded for, let's call it a relatively modest return, just for the sake of argument, I think now yeah. if the Flames are going out and trying to get, I'm just throwing some names out there of guys that might be available as rentals, Ryan Callahan or Mar Michael Granlund, or, you know, those sort of players. I think now, you know, even a Mike Hoffman, I think if you look at this deal, this really sets the bar lower, and I think makes the oh, cost of acquisition so, yeah. for anybody else significantly lower, and I think that's going to work in the Flames' favor. Yeah, well, like, it's basically made the market more of, like, getting a guy, like, when the Flames traded Yuri Hoodler, where it was a third or consecutive, or a conditional second and like you know and that was when hoodler was a 40 to 50 point player like i think that the flames like if they're going to rent somebody like it's gonna end up being not a ton uh for that acquisition and like if you look at like say the zucker trade like, uh, frankly, I wouldn't expect that to be much more than the second round pick. Like, plus maybe a fringe prospect or, you know, one of the depth guys. Like, say, throwing Jankowski in the deal or something like that. Well, what was and the deal last year? It was... Uh, Froelich, Froelich in a second. Froelich, Froelich, Froelich second. and Jankowski? Yeah. There was a second in there, from what I recall. But, yeah, it wasn't very much. And, like, it... D with this trade, like, you're not going to see, like, that level. Like, frankly, like, if the Flames say they blow the next couple months and are bad and wanting to sell, like, you're going to get, like, a first for guys like Brody and uh, Hamannick and, like, that kind of thing 
but like there's not a ton of guys that are just of that caliber on the trade market at at all. I mean, the only defenseman I would say might get more than say Brody would be Petter Angelo, but they're not going to move him. Yeah. Maybe Justin Schultz. Yeah. And then and Tory Krug I could see going for a high price. Mhm. But yeah, I think in terms of in terms of Calgary acquiring players, I think this definitely helps them. It sets the market low. Uh, I'm honestly surprised this deal got done before the deadline. But I think in terms of us trying to sell pieces, it might hurt us. If we're trying to sell a fro leak or something like that, um, you might get a little bit less. Let me spin it around. Looking at this deal, and I mean, we won't compare prospect for prospect, but two picks and three prospects, would you have wanted the Flames to have paid that price? Well... <laughs> Frankly, like that, it's not that bad of a price. Like Merkley is about comparable to Glenn Godin, like because Merkley's uh, injured prospect. Like he's not the same player when he was drafted in the first round. Uh, the third sheer guy, he's all right, but he, you know, like insert like any of the guys like uh, Kuzmatsis or you know, like that level of prospect it's about the same and the ball guy maybe shillington and a first and a third like that's not a bad price at all that would have been definitely doable um i guess the question is if you'd want to give up the potential two draft picks yeah well that's the thing like if uh the flames were (sighs) i guess it would. It's tough because of the fact that, like, to me, we've given to, up way too many draft picks lately for yeah, NHL players. That, between Hamannick, between um, you know Hamilton, and you and I have even said, look at the closets here. I mean, we've even said at rookie camp, who are these guys? They're all walk-ons. Like, I think Calgary right now needs to keep their picks and or even recoup a few picks. I don't think this is the time to be going out and trading, you know, the future anymore for young players. And I think we're already starting to see some of the lack of young players and the Flames having to potentially, you know, turn to veterans, even cheap veterans like Tobias Reeder, to fill some of those spots. Yeah, and thankfully Calgary has been able to get lucky, frankly, Drafting with a bunch light. of their, yeah, with their late round draft picks, guys like Mangiapane coming out of nowhere phillips looking like an but that's NHL gonna stop prospect. at some point too yeah but you know it, it they've been lucky and fortunate enough that guys like that then Pedersen looking good and a handful of other guys and it's one of those situations though that calgary definitely needs more young players coming through especially in the next two or three years It'll be interesting to see. Like, Calgary does need another scorer. I firmly believe that. Like, another top nine forward. If it was before. just the two first and, let's say, um, Froelich or Hamannick, like a roster player, I could see them maybe doing it. I would not be comfortable right now with Calgary giving up two first and three prospects. Like, I think right now we need all the prospects in the system we can get. Yeah. That's where I think for us, I'd be a little un- more uncomfortable. Yeah. And it is what it is. Like, you know, good for Arizona. Like, they'll it probably gets them a playoff spot with that trade. But, yeah, I don't really see it being a very big long-term help, even if he re-signs there. Um, I, I would still, like, if he's a, available in free agency, I would definitely be trying to get him. Just because, hey, free asset. Calgary but, Flames fans who want to see Taylor Hall can see him when they come to town next on March uh, 6th. Yeah. But yeah, you're it, right. It, it could be a free asset as a free agent. Um, you know, and, and I think you have to, especially because he's a Calgary boy, you got to kick the tires on it. But I've said to you before, I don't know that's the best use of money for what he's going to want. But, you know, yeah. throw an offer out there. I don't think you pursue it that hard. Toss an offer out there, see what he's interested in. Yeah, and... Here's a crazy idea. What do you think the chance is that Hall gets dealt again at the deadline? That would be... I'd feel bad for Arizona if that happened. 
Like, you know, like the Islanders, and eh, you, you know, you've won Stanley Cups in the past and you like, stop what, what if he tell that, What but... if he tells the Coyotes, I don't want to resign here? I, I can yeah. see it happening where he could get dealt again. Yeah. Uh, well, especially if he vanics them where he just uh, plays like crap because that could happen you know yeah or even if he's just not putting up the offensive numbers they expected and he's not i think they want to build a team for long term and i think that there's going to be some team who's going to have a hurt top line winger and might pay a king's ransom for him yeah it's out there but i have this sneaking suspicion in the back of my brain my hockey senses are tingling that tells me you know what this may not be taylor hall's final destination this year that I'd feel bad for Arizona if that happened, but yeah, like I could see it. It's Get two just, first back from another team. Uh, honestly, you don't. Like honestly, that you you might be able to get a second and a decent prospect. I think if they trade them, you end up getting. You'd have to trade them for NHL currency. Yeah. Like yeah, you're not gonna get what you got back at all no. and, and like those three prospects you can kiss them off and you might get a second and like the equivalent of maybe maybe merkley back which that isn't much it, like it, yeah like especially if he struggles like if he's good and the coyotes for some reason fall off the face of the earth now the playoff pitcher even if he's doing good like you might just be able to recoup your assets like i don't see and their GM is, I don't want to say crazy enough, because I don't think he's crazy, but he's hes just out there enough I could see him doing it. Yeah. Like, he's the money ball guy. That's always been how he's been, you know, pitched, is the, the analytics guy. And I could see, well, you know, the analytical numbers aren't high. Let's move them. Yeah. Like, not if they're going to be in a playoff position, but like you said, if they fall to the face of the earth, um, I could definitely... Not definitely. I can see in the back of my head, just because usually stars don't get dealt this early in the season, and if for some reason they can't make it, um, I could see Taylor Hall getting moved again. Yeah. Which Not that likely. Would be un- that'd be really unfortunate for them, but... Yeah. But you know what? May I mean, could be, might not be. Sometimes you got to take a risk, right? Yeah. Well, Matt, next week we're going to be joined once again on the show by our new friend who was on last month, Stockton's Finest, Jeff Gregory. He's going to come on and chat with us about the Stockton Heat, let us know about the the back-to-back wins this weekend. Uh, we'll talk to him about Zarnik and how hurt he looked. We'll talk to him about all those good things that are going on in Stockton, the goaltenders. So if anyone has a question for Jeff Gregory when we talk to him for next week's show, uh, tweet it to us on Twitter. We're at Fireside Podcast or on Facebook. We're Facebook.com slash fireside chat or go to our website firesidechat.ca and hit the contact link and you can get a hold of us send your questions in there and we will try to answer as many or try to get jeff to answer as many as he can when we touch base with him this week and you'll hear that in next week's show good to to catch up on stockton yeah and they've been doing good this year for a change and a lot of that has to do with the excellent performances by matthew phillips and glenn godin and we we'll should probably mention for the sake of completeness, uh, Matthew Phillips got called up this week, stayed here for three games, and sent down without playing. Yeah, which, you know, it's a good experience for him just to be able to see games at the NHL level anyway, to f- get a first-hand look to see, like, anything that he needs to work at and go from there, and hopefully... Like, he can continue to... Plus, it's a little bit of a reward. He gets a Christmas bonus. for Christmas you know. bonus, probably gets some better food, an airplane ride, all those fun things that come with the NHL. Yeah. Um, so, yeah, if you want to ask us questions about the Stockton Heat or want any information about them, let us know, um, and we'll see if we can get Jeff to answer those, and we'll put that in next week's show. And with that, we should also remind people, not only the uh, Twitter, Facebook, and the website, if you want to get a hold of us, if you want to send us a text message, maybe you're watching one of the games this week and have a quick thought, or you want to call and leave us a voicemail, I promise, Matter, I won't pick up. I've thought about it a few times people left us voicemails, but we won't pick up. Uh, you can text us or call us at 587 587- 7176 I feel like I need a jingle, like one of those bad commercials from Red Deer. Yeah. 
587-200-7176. And feel free to text us or call us, and we can get those on the show as well, even if you got some Stockton Heat questions. And, Matt, I guess that brings us to the weekly predictions. Yep. Just like the Calgary fart. Flames, my win streak ended this week. And, hey, I got on the board. Yay. Well, by, by our partial, old scoring uh, metric, you would. But people told us to simplify things a couple of years ago, so we got rid of the loser point. Yeah, well, hey, I I don't get things even partially right often, so I'm taking credit for that. <laughs> so it's, it's like when you were a kid and you play Mastermind, or I guess we still play that game, Mastermind. Matt got right number, wrong, wrong teams for the win. Um, I thought the Flames would win all three, and obviously they didn't. Matt thought they would lose to Arizona, win to Toronto and, Carol- and uh, Carolina, so he got two wins right, just not the right teams we were going to beat. Yeah. So if we look ahead to the Calgary Flames uh, week, there's four games in the docket this week. The Calgary Flames have a home game on Tuesday night against the Pittsburgh Penguins, 7 p.m. start time. On Thursday, the Montreal Canadiens come to town. That's a 7 p.m. start time in the Saddle Dome. Then they get a couple days off. They don't play Friday or Saturday. This is like the first Saturday in a long time. I can remember the Flames not playing. Uh, they played all November. Actually, this is the first Saturday of the season. They have not played. I'm just looking back at the schedule. Um, so they have Friday, Saturday off. Monday, or sorry, Sunday, they will play in Dallas, a 5 p.m. start time. And then a back-to-back Monday, 3 p.m. start time on the 23rd against the Minnesota Wild. And that is the last game before the Christmas break. So four games, two at home, two on the road, one back-to-back. Um, I'll give you my prediction first, not only for the games, but also when I think we see the backup goaltender here. Okay. Um, I'm going to go with a win against Montreal and Minnesota. A loss to Pittsburgh and Dallas. I think they're going to split the the week, and I think they'll beat, get one beat home. the easy teams and lose to the good ones. Yeah, I think they'll get one home and one road win. Uh, I think we'll get four good games, but I think that we're going to split those games going into Christmas. I think you'll see David Riddick in the Pittsburgh game, and I think he'll lose. I think they will put uh, Talbot in for Montreal, and I think they'll put Talbot in for Minnesota. Yeah. Well, I'm going to go a little different and say that they'll beat the Pittsburgh Penguins, and I think that is actually, to date, the single most important game this season. Uh, Just because of how the last one went, Pittsburgh's a decent team. Just remind people, that was really the turnaround game for the Flames last year. Yeah, that 9-1 spanking that they received from the Penguins here. at the Sal Dome, and that's when the team started to be like, oh, we're a good hockey team. We should probably play hockey, and they started winning after that. Yeah, and, I'm, you know, like uh, Penguins are 7-3 and three in their last 10 and have jumped back up into a tie for fourth in the East. So, you know, that is a very important game, both as a measuring stick – and to bounce back from the 4 nothing shutout and get back in those good habits. I think they beat Montreal. I think they beat Dallas, and I think they'll lose in Minnesota. So you think they're going to beat Pittsburgh, beat Montreal, and beat Dallas? Yeah, and then lose Minnesota. Just because that's a really long trip for, like, the next afternoon. Like, you're going all the way across country just for... You know, like in 10 hours. Type well, and of they thing. also don't do well in matinee games. No, like it's just not a fair schedule there. But, you know, it is what it is. It, that's one of those times when if you could, you'd probably run a split squad. Yeah. <laughs> it, just because, yeah, it, it's a lot of travel there. But um, And then the team gets three days off for Christmas, and they'll come back after Christmas, Edmonton on the road, Vancouver, Chicago. I think, I, you know, you're probably right that the Pittsburgh game is a measuring stick. I think the Montreal game is a confidence booster for this team. It's usually there's a lot of Montreal fans in the Dome. Um, yep. So, you know, if you're if you're playing against a team that has a lot of fans, it's sometimes hard to tell because it's like, oh, the sea of red is full. And then you look down, it's like, no, red and blue over there. Okay, red and blue over there. Um, but, you know, the team always gets up when the Dome is full. And then... I don't know what to expect from Dallas. That's kind of the the game I'm not sure of this week. Yeah. Well, the Dallas games are in Dallas are always annoying because for some reason, they always seem to get goals from randomly 
annoying players like Ribeiro used to score a lot of goals for them when he was there and we always seem to have a hard time in Dallas but I think they'll get the win on that one and then because of the travel they'll lose in Minnesota I don't I think the Flames are probably going to give up I'm just looking at the schedule I think they're going to end up giving up a point to Pittsburgh I don't think you win that one in regulation if you do win and I don't know I feel like they'll give up a point to either Dallas or Minnesota but I don't know which one yeah well, they just have to play their game. If they do so, they'll win more than they lose, and that's it's the important thing. It's also not only the Minnesota game because of the travel, but usually that first, that last game before Christmas, and that first game after, which is going to be Edmonton, often the team's head is at Christmas and not in the in the hockey game, and that's another reason I think they might not do well against Minnesota. Yeah, could very well be. Well, just Matt, hoping for the best, that's all. Matt, I think that wraps it up for this week. Yep. Any other Flames news you want to talk about? Do you want to go through the CBA and figure out this Austin Zarnick thing? Uh, no, I think I'm good. Good. I figure that the lawyers have already figured that one out. And I'll uh, I'll see friend of the show Ryan Pike on Thursday, and I'm sure he'll figure it out. He's the guy who carries the CBA with him. Yeah. So I'm sure Ryan will have some answers for us next week. Yep. And we'll an- we'll see if we can get an answer on that one. Somebody will have an answer. I'll find somebody. I'm sure, you know, hanging around uh, in the bowels of the dome, there's lots of people with answers. I'll just find the right one. Yeah. All right, well, enjoy this week of games, however it turns out. And uh, hopefully by next week, we can be ahead of Edmonton. That's my goal for the week. I really don't care what they win or lose. We just got to stay above Edmonton. Yeah, well, that's what I'm wanting for Christmas is to be ahead of the Oilers in the standings. Especially after they were 10 points up on us like three weeks ago. Well, maybe this team will get that for you as a late Boxing Day gift because I think that 27th game could be two teams that are tied. Yeah. Oh, I'm hoping we're ahead by then. Yeah, but I don't know. It depends how much Edmonton's goaltending continues to falter. Yeah. Well, Edmonton did win tonight, so that's, you know, they're back ahead of us by two points. Y- yeah, we'll see. I mean, you and I talked about it, right? The whole division is separated by nine. Um, yeah. So two points is not much in the grand scheme of things. We just got to keep getting our two points as well. Yep. All right. Well, Matt, why don't you sign us off? As always, go Flames, go. Fireside Chat is hosted by Dan Stevenson, co-hosted by Matt DeBorg. This episode produced and edited by Peter Marino. Fireside Chat is licensed under Creative Commons license. For full license details, visit firesidechat.ca.